Hello, and welcome back to the first real lecture in this series, where I'm going to now be talking about variations on the Turing machine model and why it's robust and why it's, in fact, a reasonable model to study at all. So um, in order to discuss that, let's take a picture, take a look at what the model of Turing machine is that you've been looking at. It probably looks something like this. You have this infinite uh, tape that has some input written on it, and you've got this box that walks around and reads and writes on the tape. Um, so that's one possibility, but maybe what you've been exposed to, depending on what text you're looking at, looks more like this, where you have a two-way infinite tape, where um, everything else is the same. Um, this is clearly no less powerful <clears throat> than the one-way infinite tape model, because if you um, just have a, a two-way infinite tape and you want to simulate a one-way infinite tape, you can just ignore everything that's to the left of the input, and maybe, in fact, you find it convenient to uh, mark that spot so that you can also simulate the situation of falling off the end of the tape, so you can make absolutely sure that there's uh, no difference in these models. <clears throat> um, but how about going the other way? Well, this is also pretty easy to see. If you um, consider that the tape might just as well be viewed as sort of a fat tape that can store a lot of um, of symbols, maybe you know a pair of symbols instead of just one symbol. And um, let's say that you were simulating a computation using a two-way infinite tape that started and moved over here onto the uh, part that's to the left of the work tape. Um, well, now you can simulate that using computation where instead you uh, go over here and, oh, here's the end of the uh, tape marker. So I just go up here and continue going in this direction where that uh, top part of the fat tape is just viewed as the, uh, the tape that had been uh, going infinitely off in the other direction. So you can think of this sort of like a, uh, a folding carpenter's ruler, where you can uh, just take this part and move it, flip it over on, on top. Um, so that's a pretty easy, simple idea, and um, maybe not even the most interesting variant that we might want to consider. Later on, we're definitely going to need to be talking about um, multi-tape Turing machines, particularly when you start talking about complexity theory. And a multi-tape Turing machine is just what it sounds like. You've got another tape sitting here, and I'm going to go ahead and make that uh, have a couple of rows where you've got some you can use this as workspace and uh, do some writing there. And maybe you've got several tapes. Um, again, this is certainly no less powerful than just having one tape. And going the other way, if you've got a multi-tape machine, you can simulate it using, um, using a, uh, a one-tape machine by, again, just doing the same silly idea of viewing your tape as being a fat tape. So put all of this sort of on just one fat tape. And these heads can move around and read both of them. And we'll also mark certain cells as being the ones that are currently being scanned. And in order to simulate a single step of the multi-tape machine on this machine with one fat tape, what can we do? We can just scan all the way across and see what is being 
scanned by each of the symbols. And then after I've uh, seen what all of those heads are scanning, then I can move back across the tape and do an update, uh, let's say moving that head that direction, moving this head to the other direction and changing symbols as need be. So again, a very uh, simple change. And again, perhaps not extremely interesting. So what's a more interesting variant of the uh, Turing machine model? We're certainly going to be very interested in the non-deterministic Turing machine model, which since you've studied finite automata and pushdown automata, you're by now familiar with the non-deterministic model. And you can think of a computation on a non-deterministic machine as proceeding something like a tree. Here's your initial configuration. And let's say that there's two next moves possible for any uh, step of the machine and for any configuration, there's going to be, let's say, two possible next moves. And so you have this tree going on like that. And if there is n that leads to an accepting configuration, a halting accepting node, then we say that the non-deterministic machine accepts its input. So in terms of language recognizers, it's pretty clear what you want to do with non-deterministic machines. Uh, it's not so simple and elegant to talk about non-deterministic machines computing functions. So when we talk about non-deterministic machines, it's usually in the context of these yes or no questions. Is an input in the language or not? So how would we simulate a non-deterministic machine deterministically? Um, it's a very simple idea. We're just going to explore that entire tree. We'll have one tape that uh, you know starts off with our input on it. And the very first thing we're going to do is copy that input onto the work tape. And down on this third tape, we're going to enumerate 0, 1 star. So, you know, we'll start off with a 0 and then we'll replace that with uh, a 1 and then we'll replace that with 0, 0, etc. Looking at all of the possible uh, strings of, over the alphabet 0, 1 and this corresponds to searching through the tree. So zero correspond to moving to the left. So zero corresponds to this computation path of length one that just takes the rightmost branch. And if that leads us to an accepting path, then we'll say, okay, we accept. Otherwise, we look at one. And if that leads us to an accepting path, we say we accept. And otherwise, we go over here. Zero, zero would correspond to that path. Zero, one here, et cetera. We just try at one after another, all the paths of length two until we will have checked to see if any of the path, the configurations at that node are accepting. And after each time we explore things, we just erase whatever we had on this uh, work tape and re with our input, because we have this uh, input sitting up here at the uh, original input tape, just handy dandy to use for that reason. And so we just uh, explore the entire tree. And if there is an accepting path, we will eventually find one and halt and accept. And um, so great. Unlike with uh, pushdown automata, non-deterministic Turing machines and deterministic Turing machines both give us the uh, computably enumerable sets. So um, perhaps a more important question you're seeing after uh, seeing these symbols is why Turing machines at all? 
why don't we base our model of computation on something like uh, Java or C++ or Python or something else that's you know a little bit easier to program in than Turing machines. Um, well, sure, you can do that. Um, you know, any of these programming languages, of course, have a uh, language description manual that's a few hundred pages thick. And so uh, it's not going to be as easy to describe what's going on as with the description of a Turing machine, which in some sense is like the original reduced instruction set computer because there are not very many instructions there for you to use. Um, but we're not going to prove this in detail, but it's not very hard to see that anything that you can pro write a program in, in one of your favorite programming languages, you can write something with the same input output behavior in any other programming language, including Turing machines. And, you know, you can, let's just sketch a little bit about what's going on. Let's say that you uh, wanted to simulate a, uh, a particular program. You know, what is that? That's a finite length uh, list of instructions with uh, various control moves through it. And what motivates uh, the, the flow of control in the program? Well, it's based on the data. And if you store your data on the tape, let's say you've got a region for uh, any particular variables that you've uh, stored, um, and you, you just know how to, to locate those variables, uh, and you're walking around on the tape, you read what's there, and maybe it says, oh, copy, uh, the value of one variable into another. Well, we know how to do that on Turing machines. Uh, maybe you do a uh, subroutine call. What would you do to implement a subroutine call? Well, you'd walk all the way over to the blank portion of the tape and you'd copy your arguments to the procedure here and uh, then you would put a little marker here so you'd know where what part of the tape is uh, legal to use for the subroutine. And then just using your finite control, you would jump to the code for the subroutine, you'd start executing it. And um, then when it had uh, completed, you'd go back to where you had been before, where you had uh, you know, information marked. Um, it's a boring exercise, but a routine exercise to translate anything you can do in your favorite programming language to Turing machines. Um, our next lecture uh, is going to touch on maybe the more interesting question about why we still use this particular model, the Turing machine, what was Turing's motivation, and what is the church Turing thesis That is the topic of our next lecture. Bye-bye.